Hello amateurs and welcome to another episode of the Amateur Rugby Podcast, here to help soothe your Sunday morning hangover with some wonderful rugby chat about the grassroots of the game. I'm your host Tim and I've got another fantastic guest for you today. This man is from the great county of Essex but moved to Canada in 2010. He lives in a town that's got my favourite place name in the entire world and he's doing a ton to promote rugby and help the grassroots as well. Please welcome Mr. Dan Tanner. Dan, how are you? I'm great, thanks, Tim. Good morning. Good morning to you. Now then, tell me about the place where you live and, uh, and yeah, t- tell me a little bit about it. Um, I live in a place called Squamish and uh, it's about 17,000, 18,000 people and it's between the city of Vancouver in British Columbia, Canada and the ski resort of Whistler. We're kind of, we're kind of like... We used to be we used to be known as the McDonald's between Whistler and Vancouver, but uh, since real estate has improved and people have got more into the uh, the outdoor outdoor sports and outdoor activities, it's now a destination for mountain biking and and uh, camping and all sorts of things. We've got two or three good big breweries here, and um, people are buying up housing here, so the population is really growing. But yeah, we're the, we're a Small mountain town between between uh, between Whistler and uh, Vancouver, BC. Yeah, and it is a really beautiful place. I've been there, Dan, as I told you before, and it's actually the only place in the last twenty years where I did some rock climbing. Believe it or not. Yeah, oh yeah, big big climbing, big climbing community here as well. Yeah. Yeah, and it's uh, yeah the name of it. I just love it for some reason. It's just an interesting name, Squamish. Okay, let's go back, get into the rugby and back to your early days in the UK. How did rugby come about for you, Dan? How did, how did you first get into it? Well, I, I didn't start playing rugby. I, I never played any sort of youth rugby. Um, I went to the University of Huddersfield when I was 20 and I played football there the entire time. And uh, I met a big second row at a house party who said, said to me, that you're, you're, you're not a football player, you're a rugby player. I'm like, well, I've never played any rugby before and I'm quite happy playing football. And uh, the um, the uh, the origins of me playing, where I, I actually lost a drinking game, and uh, I ended up playing for the second team for Huddersfield uh, YMCA uh, in Yorkshire. Um, the next morning, uh, hungover, um, being given a pair of boots and ironically a McDonald's breakfast on the way there, and I got I'd never played front row. I'd never played in today's in today's uh, climate. They ever want to be screaming, clutching their pearls, saying how dangerous it is to put someone in straight into the front row without any training. They threw me straight in there at tight head, and uh, I was hooked. And uh, I just I finished playing about twelve months ago, so I played about I played pretty much twenty three years since then um, across many different countries and got involved in rugby. So it was a chance encounter at a house party at university that turned into a turned into a lifestyle, you know. Wonderful. I love these origin stories and particularly the ones where rugby comes to people sort of slightly later in life, you know, beyond the adolescent years. So what was it like after that first like baptism of fire, which I'm sure it must have been? What was it like after that in the coming sort of weeks as you sort of grew to sort of understand and, and play the game a little bit more? Well, they, they put me, it was two things. I remember them putting me in the front row and me thinking, this isn't really as hard as it looks from the sideline. <laughs> But then trying to be out in the field and then thinking this is harder than it looks from the sideline, not knowing where to stand and not knowing like whether I'm running because football's all about space. You've got to find space. Whereas rugby, especially when you're a big boy, you've got to follow the train and you've got to protect the ball and make sure it's getting distribution and ruck over. So like going from a football brain to a rugby brain is uh, the it, it's when you're a big boy and you you know you, you you consider yourself strong. The scrum is not that that much of a leap, but the outfield players a massive leap. And uh, there's a lot. Of, I feel like I'll probably get shouted out for this, but I feel there's a lot more intelligence playing outfield in rugby than there maybe is in football, or maybe a diff, just a different different type of intelligence. And uh, I just I just I, I still didn't want to play for my university because I didn't particularly like the guys that were playing rugby at my university and all my friends were footballers. So I I carried on playing football for my uni, but the, uh, the more I played, uh, the more I wanted to play. Uh, So it wasn't long before football was kind of forgotten. And uh, and I ended up just um, playing rugby after university and being a bit of a, 
um, sort of traveling traveling rugby prop. Yeah. So did you did you always play tight head then throughout your entire playing career? Yeah, I, I, classic joke. Other than times when I'm too tired, so I look like a winger. You know, classic <laughs> classic prop thing. But yeah, I've, I've only ever played tight head with with me being right handed, right footed, right sided. For some reason, you, you know, I don't know if this is the same for a lot of tight heads that are, that are right sided, but you put me at loose. It's a, it's a waste of time. I'm 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 terrible at loose. I'm too big for hooker. I could probably play second row, but I think I feel that second row is probably a bit bit too intelligent for me. <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of alluded to it then. You became a sort of a, a travelling tight end. T- tell me about that. Why were you sort of all over the country playing for all these different teams? Well, obviously, I, I did journalism at university. And classically, when you leave university, you do nothing to do with the actual degree that you got. So I went into the family trade, which was which was the pub trade. And uh, first area I ended up in was Canby Island. So I played for Canby Island for, I think, two seasons. Uh, before I moved to Reading, uh, and then I played for Reading Abbey for for two or three seasons, and then I, I played for East London, I played for West London, um, then I ended up living in um, Northern Ireland because um, I got a job with British Telecom. I ended up playing for Enna Skilling in County Fermanagh. Came back to came back to uh, Reading at the end of my uh, contract at BT. Um, and then met a Canadian girl. Um, we dated for about a year, and then her visa ran out, and I moved to Canada with her. Um, I played for uh, Merrill Aromas, uh, and then Capilano in British Columbia. Quit rugby for a couple of seasons because I wasn't sure I wanted to play anymore. Then ended up playing, I think, five five seasons for the Axemen uh, in Squamish, who were a team that were rebuilt from the ground up um, by seven or eight sort of guys that wanted to get rugby going on the on the Sea to Sky Corridor again, sort of North Van to, to Whistler. It's actually the original uh, club that Jamie Cudmore played for uh, of, of Claremont and, and he was captain Canada. Um, and the uh, the club got built from the ashes up and they've won, I think, two or three provincial championships now. And um, just recently the club had like 60 players out across the province. They had like a women's team and a second, a first and a second team out. All in all, it was about 60, 65 players out on a Saturday, which to go from, you know, seven or eight years of like seven players playing touch to the 60 players out playing competitive rugby was a massive achievement, massive benchmark and achievement for the club. So, so I've, never, I've never been, the, the big thing about playing in Canada, and I was part of the first provincial championship win with the Axemen um, is that in the UK, you win something. And yeah, it means something. And the championship or a league title or a cup is, of course, it absolutely means something. But you just go onto a onto a plaque with a bunch of other team names from the 80s and 90s. They've all done it before. When you a lot of, There's a lot of times in Canada when you win something, especially with a club like the Axemen that were, that were built up from the ground up, there's never won anything before, so you end up being part of like the first team that that won a championship, and you sit on the bus on the way back from the from the um, from the from the ground where you just won. And you're like, wow, that's actually a, a a really big deal, you know. Especially especially being British, coming from a uh, a country and a culture where big dusty clubhouses with with shields on the wall, and you know, like all these guys that have come before you, and you're you're the first guy now, you know. So it's uh, quite it's a little emotional and, and quite a big deal to be honest that sounds amazing what i really want to know is is how did you do that how did the club sort of rise from the ashes? what were some of the tactics that, that you used to get people engaged again and coming out and playing for the x-men well to be honest with you, I, I i other than being a player and, and talking warmly about the club and, and trying to bring other players in well you know i was i wasn't a, a massive um part of the of the growth of the club. We had sort of like a set seven players or a mixture of English and Irish and Canadian guys, uh, plus some local local guys that would, would sponsor the club and help them out financially. And it just it just grew like and, and, and you know it's like you have good people involved in the club. And these these six or seven guys that started the Axe Men, they were good people. They kept they kept you know grumpy props like me around. Uh, and brought in other players uh, and other players and seven becomes 10, 10 becomes 15. And uh, 
we've had a core maybe 15 to 20 players that have been consistent. And then we have the the seasons of players that come in, the Irish, English, Canadians that come for ski season. Uh, we get those players um, between Squamish and Worcester as well. So it's just it's just grown. Um, it's a it's a it's, it's more than more than just a game. It's you know the, the a lot of the club members consider consider themselves family, and um, we have a youth program now that's run by some separate guys, but under the Axemen umbrella, and we're very much connected. They have anywhere between sort of 60 and 100 kids training with them now. Um, it's just grown organically. I know everyone wants to like swap, um, and rightly so, swap notes for like, how did you develop and what were, you know, what were the key things you did? But I often find when I, when I talk about rugby growth and I hear about rugby growth, it's just good people being consistent um, and garner, garnering trust and garnering friendship and, and, um, and, and just, just, just being decent people and and doing what they say they're going to do and, and going above and beyond and uh, trying to encourage others to jump in and help with the load and before you know it you've just developed this like just this posse of people that are just in love with rugby and are just getting on with it you know there's no real I don't find there's any real like formula to it oh well, you've got to do this at this point and week three you've got to do this like it's just it's just sticking to it and being consistent and and uh, showing showing how good the game can be you know because we we yeah we I'm 43. And I feel like I've been. I feel like I say to people all the time, you know, especially parents that I meet that are thinking about putting their kids in the game. I'm like it's not just a game. Like, and, and it's and when you, you 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 could talk for an hour about why it's not just a game, or two, three hours, or why it's not just a game. But the sport has taken me like over a big chunk of the world, um, and I've made so many friends. And I've had so many experiences. I was in the reporter's box for the All Blacks Island game at Soldier Field when Ireland won, beat the All Blacks for the first time in over 100 years. Like, I've been at tournaments in Montana, like 10 miles down the road from where Yellowstone shot. You know, like, like all these things that I've done are completely related to rugby. And you know yourself, you can go to any any town, city, country in the world, you know, if you, if you want to meet people and if you want 15 brothers, 15 sisters, you know, and uh, a bunch of connections. Can you help me out with a job? Do you know where I can live? You go to the local rugby club and you go, well, I'm a winger, I'm a prop. Um, and you get integrated you know, fairly quickly. I've never I've never seen anyone turned away from an ever in a world of inclusivity. And, you know, no, we'll never go too deep into that. But we've, uh, we've, I've never seen anybody turned away from a rugby club. So the whole idea of, uh, of not being inclusive, as much as I appreciate the drive for inclusivity, it's kind of alien to me because even before it was fashionable, the, the you know, inclusive was the fashionable buzzword in the eighties, nineties. You know, whenever whenever negative things were at their height, whatever the subject of those negative things could turn up to a rugby club, and everyone would be like, "Hey, how are you? Like, have you got boots? No, someone find him some boots. Get him on the field. Like, where do you play? Here's a beer." And like, and the, the only people I've ever seen get threatened with being kicked out of clubs are people that don't don't want people in clubs. <laughs> that, have, that have negative opinions though so we've always we've always uh sheriffed our own and we've always uh we've always been we've always po- we're all we've always policed our own community to make sure that everybody's everybody's included and everybody's welcome and uh all the worst sort of stuff and i don't know i don't know what you think about that yeah i mean i completely agree and i wanted to dig a little bit deeper into your experiences as somebody who you know, went to a lot of clubs in the UK due to moving around, you know, did you have like an in at those clubs or did you just literally rock up with your boots and say, hi, I'm Dan? How, how did it work for you? Well, there's all different ways. Um, Canby Island, I, I walked down to the club and I watched the game. I said, I want to play. And uh, and uh, the, 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 the director there said, why didn't you tell me 15 minutes ago you could have started today? <laughs> <laughs> we needed a prop. Um and uh, Red Nabby, uh, I got introduced to somebody in the pub. Um, a, guy, you know, Luke, a guy called Luke Dollard. Who, uh, Luke Luke Dollard uh, at Red Nabby Rugby Club in Berkshire, UK. I swear that guy must have recruited upwards of fifty to fifty to seventy five players for that club by meeting people on on our nights out and being like. <laughs> 
look how cool rugby is. We're in shirts and ties and all these girls talking to us and we're all friends and it's amazing. And we go all over the place. And then next week, there'd be the two guys there from Walkabout or from O'Neill's uh, training with us. And he'd have two more. It was like he was the, he was like he was the, uh, he was like he was collecting souls. You know, like nobody would turn Luke down. Like that we would all come to training. Um, so, uh, and then uh, well, Hudders, Huddersfield, my original club, I lost a bet. Um, Ennis Skilling, I, you know, I went down there and said I want to play. They stuck me in. Um, uh, you, you know, you know yourself. There's no real. You just if uh, the, the, the I think the, I think from I think the takeaway from this is maybe what you're digging for is like how do people get involved in rugby? You just just don't be don't be fearless, don't or be fearless. There's there's nobody at a rugby club that's going to be that's going to be mean to you or disparaging. If you turn up and say I'm interested in rugby, you could have played no rugby whatsoever. It's fine. You could have played all the rugby. It's amazing. That's amazing. They'll stick you in somewhere. There's a place for everybody. Uh, it's always been the way. Um, I've never seen anyone turned away from a club. I saw a player once that decided that the, the, the playing wasn't for them and a club put them through their physio badges, um, their basic physio and everything. And then they were a physio because they still wanted to be around the club, but they just weren't a player. So they stuck them for their physio. The, the person would work on the bar a couple of nights a week because they wanted to be part of the club. Um, and that's just how rugby works. You know, it's just, uh, it's, uh, so it's a lot, what's the game? I'll probably say it's a lot. It's a, it's a lot more than the game, you know? Yeah. Something else you mentioned a minute ago that, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to dig into as well is the seasonal players that you mentioned. Because I've seen this in various clubs around the world where you get people come in for a period of time, but they're only there for a few months. How, how does that work exactly? Is it the same players that come back every year or is it a fresh crop? And is it, how does a club feel about that? Is it, again, is it very easy to integrate those players or is it a bit of a challenge? How does it work? Well, there's, there's, a, there's a level of understanding there. Um, and it's not like, from a negative aspect, like it's not like somebody comes in and I, I would have been there five seasons and they just take my spot. Um, yeah, we start fresh at the start of every season. Yeah, we all go to training. We all compete for our spots, and best man wins. Best man gets the spot. Uh, doesn't matter if you've been there five years or, or five games. Yeah, you know, like they're not just they're not going to bring a bring a, a star in and just drop someone who hasn't tra- tra- trained, just stick them straight in and dump you. Like you're going to train and you're all compete for your spots. It's, the the clubs is maybe ten fifteen percent of players are the seasonal players. And they're always different. Um, but the 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 way the seat the working seasons fall, it pretty much mirrors the rugby season. Um, so we don't we don't have a lot of people coming in midway. Um, it's usually it's it's usually um, uh, you, they're usually there the whole season, um, sometimes two. Um, but the, the the seasonal players coming in um, can't give you like a direct schematic, but it, it's never. It's never, it's never been anything negative. Like, you know, players haven't been dropped. The, you know, you know, you know, seasoned players haven't been dropped for like the superstar coming in or anything like that. It's always been, you go to training, you know, you get your shots or audition and, and get the part. Yeah, you know, just, just the way the other club functions to compete for places. You know. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds very healthy. Now then, the name, the X Men. Tell me about that. Where does that come from exactly? Because it's a cool name. So, other than the fact that Squamish is a logging town, um, I think it just directly comes from there. Um, originally, the name was Squamish Axe Men, um, but the um, the club felt that they did they wanted to try and encourage the entire Sea to Sky because we have like Whistler and Pemberton uh, up to Lillooet, and then we have North Vancouver, the other west of North Vancouver, the other way. They wanted to make sure we weren't sort of geographically like blocking ourselves when everyone people thinking oh I live in Whistler I can't play for Squamish um so they dropped the Squamish and just it was just Axemen rugby um but Squamish is, is historically a very big logging town and they have uh, every year they have loggers sports here um which is a uh, during a particular part of the year during like, the summer they have loggers competitions where it's like climb up the trees and stand on the log and chopping logs and all that sort of stuff. It's a pretty big deal in Squamish is over a whole weekend. And uh so yeah, just the general theme of Squamish is is that it was a was a fairly sort of like um working, you yeah, know, blue collar like logging town once upon a time before they started building fancy condos and 
putting in sexy bakeries. <laughs> it was, uh, I think that's, that's just basically where the name comes from. Right, cool. I, I saw some of that login. I saw a demonstration of it while I was there. It is highly impressive stuff, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Those guys? Yeah, they're yeah. crazy. <laughs> now then, um, talking about differences between rugby in the UK and Canada, obviously Canada is enormous, but at the level that you play at, what's, what's the kind of travel scenarios like? Like how long are the away games, all that kind of stuff? Well, generally, the away games aren't too bad. So, normal season, we'll go down to um, we'll go down to uh, like mainland Vancouver, and it's maybe like an hour, an hour and a half, depending on what team we're playing downtown uh, and traffic. So, yeah, generally, generally about an hour. But every now and then, we have to go to um, places like Kelowna and Kamloops, which are like the other side of BC. That's more of like a five or six hour drive. Um, and then when playoffs come around, every now and then we have to go to the island, the Vancouver Island, to play a playoff. And that's like um, um, an hour to the ferry. The ferry is maybe two hours. Uh, and then whatever the drive is, depending on where we're playing, could be another hour, two hours. That's a that's a whole day out. And gen- generally, when you go play on the island, you'll stay you'll stay overnight as well to make a night of it, uh, and then come back the next day. Um, so yeah, there, there's trips, but it's not it's not too bad. The, the biggest road trips come from uh, summer rugby tournaments. Tell me about those. Where, where do you go? What, what are, they, are these like sevens or tens or fifteens? How does it work? Uh, all sorts. Um, so there's um, Williams Lake hold a uh, hold a rugby tournament on Canada Canada Day weekend, which is usually around July first. That's a fifteens tournament. And it's pretty famous. I mean, it's it's like two or three fields. Um, they've got um, they've got a glorious clubhouse that looks like some out of a, a John Candy eighties movie. It looks like a, a cabin chalet thing that they host all their beer, beers and parties at. Um, everyone camps around the fields in tents, and uh, the winners the winners on the on the Sunday they get these um, notorious uh, Williams Lake belt buckles. It's the William, it's the Williams Lake Stampede Stampede Rugby Tournament. Uh, so they're they're quite well. Those buckles are quite sought after in the rugby community, and uh, they've been hosting that for a long time now, and uh, they do really well on that. There's um, uh, also in um, British Columbia. There's um, uh, Sasquatch Tens, which Chilliwack host. Um, that see Williams Lake's about six hours away. Chilliwack's only about maybe two hours away. Uh, but the holy grail of social tournaments is Maggot Fest. Which is held by a rugby club called the Missoula Maggots, which no one could ever believe that's the name, but they are called the Missoula Maggots, and uh, it's about eleven hours, twelve hours there and back. It's in Missoula, Montana, and it's just a it's a fifteens weekend of, of rugby and debauchery, and the whole town gets taken over by rugby players for that weekend. Um, they have a big game on the Friday night of the, a local touring team. Uh, Thursday or Friday night, and then the tournament starts on the Saturday. You play two games on the Saturday and one on the Sunday, and uh, the two the two trophies are best on best on field and best social. Um, so we never really had an interest in in the fancy dress and the social. We, we our, our, our social was, our fancy dress was always pretty tame, uh, but some people go all out, and you see like chariots coming through and Romans and and. Uh, people dressed in like CIA outfits with one guy in the middle was the president and like everyone getting cleared out. Like people, some people go sort of whole hog with it. And, uh, we've won the, we've in the four or five years we went twice. We won best on field. Um, the first year I think is cause we actually were the best on field. The second time we won it, I think it's cause I'd brought about $400 of craft beer for the referees. <laughs> 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 that's yeah, that's the tournament. But the these guys have been running this tournament for I believe fifty plus years, and uh, it's one of the most well known social tournaments in the uh, in the uh, in the Americas. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's pretty fantastic. We've done five of them now, but it's a lot to organise. So, we, so we, ironically, when we when we do Magafest, like I run the tour like a Lions tour. We, we bring in players from all over Canada, generally BC. We'll bring in some from Alberta. We've had a couple from the UK come over. We've had some, some from Ontario. So we, we bring players together. But we take a team to, to win. Um, and we have professional kit. 
hotel bookings. We have, we have a nice place to stay. We have team dinners. We have jersey presentation, just like a Lions tour. We have fines, everything. But obviously, on, you know, and we, we, we try to win on the field. But then after after everything's said and done, we're there to have fun and have some drinks and get in some trouble, uh, acceptable trouble. But uh, yeah, we we set the tour up as uh, as professionally as we can because we want it. You know, we want the guys to. We we all want to be pro players for a weekend, you know. So we kind of like set up the simulation weekend where you've got everything everything that a pro player would have for a weekend, but without the responsibility. That sounds absolutely incredible, and it's something that I've now just added to my sort of rugby bucket list. I will get there one day, I'm sure. Um, oh yeah. How do you go about recruiting the players for this thing? Then is it is it something? Is it just players that you know, or do players get recommended to you? How does that work? Well, the, the first year we did it, it was um, just word of mouth, and it was just it was just talking to our friends, and we put we pulled a squad together from the club I was playing for at the time, which was Capilano. But then after that, the other the other five years, our, our tour that I got tour got such a good rep from people that people were actually asking to come on tour with us. Um, and then we just, you know, we we adopted the the uh, the no dickheads policy, and uh, you know, people had to be in order to get on the tour, you had to be recommended by an existing tour member, so that it was on them. Um, and uh, I think in the five or six years we did we did the the tour into Missoula, uh, I think we only ever we I think we only ever sent two, you know, told two people they weren't a repeat. And that, and that we took that that would have been out of like 150, 160 players. So that's a pretty good strike rate, Dan. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, on, on one of the guys, I thought I always feel bad for one of the guys. He didn't really do anything wrong. It was just that like he couldn't. He was diabetic, um, and just refused to look after himself. Uh, so like it was just it just kept finding him sort of like almost dead, in a, like in a field because like he just drank himself into a stupor and like hadn't hadn't just taken his basic responsibilities and like we love you like you're great but you know you, you, I, I can't have I can't have a player die so uh, if you want to come to, if you want to come to on tour you have to have to go with a different team because we can't we're, yeah we're all responsible for ourselves here we can't look after you like that like you can have to yeah it wasn't it wasn't yeah we tried but. If uh, he wasn't listening, so we had to tell him not to come back. And, and the other, and the, and the other one person that we asked not to come back was just there. Uh, was just he was just he was just an idiot. So, oh well, it happens. <laughs> it does happen. Um, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Now then, it sounds these these tournaments. It sounds like there's a lot of energy around those. But what's it like? What's the grassroots game like generally in Canada? Is it sort of is it growing? Is it is it sliding away? How is the general feel over there at the moment? There's a very, there's a very difficult question because there's things that happen in Canada that I feel paper over the cracks. Um, so, rugby Ontario seems very stable because they're they're right there with rugby Canada. Everything seems very very fluid and professional. Um, there's, um, I'll tell you, it's, it's probably not growing. Um, there's a uh, there's an issue here where they, they keep having people uh, administer rugby or they keep putting people in charge of rugby that actually never even touched a rugby ball or have any passion for rugby and often you, you might even think they don't like rugby but they're getting paid to they're getting paid to administer it um, and the clubs the clubs are all held up by sort of bastions of the game like a particular family name or yeah, you know, a particular uh, particular group of people that you know l- people get older and people have families and grow out of the club eventually, um, and so it's just it's worrying that uh, there's going to be a, a, a lot of there's a lot of situations at each club, a, a person or persons that are keeping the club going, and you wonder what's going to happen once they're gone. Um, the the structure of rugby in Canada. Is uh, is very um, um, unproductive and aggressive. Um, rugby Canada doesn't really support grassroots rugby. Um, rugby Rugby Canada's whole mandate is what they do is every five years they bring out um, they bring out um, a, uh, a glossy call to action of everything they're going to do for the next five years. Uh, 
um, a mission statement. And it's basically every five years, it's the same mission statement done by a different different graphic designer um, with no, with no, um, 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 with no like targets on, uh, with no targets or no, no, no numericals on. And so it's just, we need to get more people playing and we need to do this and we need to get, we need to make our national teams healthy and, um, just like a supermarket, man. Like for the next five years, we're going to sell fruit and we're <laughs> going to sell bread and we're going to sell milk. You're like, well, that's great, but how much is the milk? I don't know. <laughs> you know, like, it's, there's no, there's no plan. The the people that have the provincial positions and certainly the people that run Rugby Canada, there's no transparency there and things just don't get done um, ever and whilst the last 15 years whilst some of the second tier like georgia and you know arguably you know argentina who aren't quite second tier anymore um portugal spain spain who are probably the most underrated international growth in the world right now they they, they host spanish domestic cup finals that fill up football stadiums 15 30,000 people and no one seems to know about um Whilst they were all looking to professionalise and bring on standards and, and bring on, you know, impact studies and um, put in structure, Canada were focused on being the last bastion of the amateur game um, with a group of older heads spending most of the money and, and most of the resources congratulating themselves for how amazing they were back in the day for the last 10 to 15 years sitting in boxes at all the events with eating sandwiches with the crust cut off and and uh swilling gin and and uh, making sure that they had 15 show ponies um to take them to the world cup every four years so they could have drinks with their buddies until they realized oh we've run out of show ponies and we haven't made it to the world cup now now what do we do oh i don't know panic and uh so we had this new guy brought in, um, I can't remember, it's come his last name now, but Nathan, who was uh, who was like the top boy at Glasgow Warriors, and apparently did very well there, and he took over the CEO job of Rugby Canada. But other than other than the things that he's just generally supposed to do, haven't really seen much of him. He turned up in the boxes at Canada Sevens like like they all do, and uh, and uh, but we haven't seen him in the clubs. Haven't seen him. Um, haven't seen him, t- you know, haven't seen him much on social media. I haven't seen him much uh, at any events or anything like that. I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure the ones with the free dinner, he's he's front of the queue for the for the for the for the pate. Um, but uh, I'm very very cynical about um, both Canada and the US. They have such a, a massive uh, responsibility opportunity uh, in rugby that they're just absolutely squandering. Um, and if anything, Canada has a real danger of losing the game um, if they don't heavily restructure soon and if someone doesn't hold these people accountable for their finances. Um, if you, it, these salaries are six, some of these salaries are six figure salaries as well. You gave me a six figure salary to run rugby in Canada or even rugby in British Columbia. I'd get on the road, I'd drive and I'd go see all the clubs. I'd be like, what's what's going wrong? Shout at me, have a go at me, let's go, let's fix it. I'd get all the problems and put them all out of the spreadsheet and be like, right, this call to action is garbage. It means nothing. It's not transparent. It doesn't set any targets. How do we how do we fix this? Like other other people have healthy have healthy structures. New Zealand have a healthy structure. England have some semblance of a structure. You know, Wales clearly don't. Um, but yeah, you know, there's there's lots of other countries that have stuff going on. Like how like how do we how do we fix this? Who do we have to bring in? Uh, and just get on with it. But there's no there's no doing mentality. There's there's uh, there. You always hear how hard they were. Oh, we're working so hard, we can barely get a holiday. We can barely have any time off. You're like, well, but what have you done? You've you've put on a provincial finals. That's it. Like, oh, and you've and you've sent somebody else out to the the boonies to run a refereeing course. Good for you. Um. So yeah, rug, rug, rugby in Canada's in a in a real in a real bad way. USA rugby. Has had some challenges, but I hold some hope for the US with the emergence of USMLR and US US Major League Rugby had some very good, very good, very capable humans running it. Um, 
uh, so the, the structure there looks 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 fairly promising. They, they've managed to hold the league together, so there's a there's a chance there's a chance of survival there. And uh, if anything, um, the, the just the, there's a lot of transparency there. There's a lot of uh, a lot of public information out there about the organisation. They don't seem to hide behind anything. They they promote things and they promote players, uh, and coaches, and they you know, they're trying to build the game. Whereas, yeah, rugby Canada's just been rugby Canada's are, uh, under the microscope. I mean, I, I think the overall problem with professional rugby and uh, with the growth of rugby is um, you know back in the day the old Will, Will Carlin quote like was it fifty four old farts or whatever it was or 30, 32 old farts. We just got this. It's difficult because you don't want to disrespect them. We have we have these old farts. The I always say these like gin swilling old white men, um, and you you don't want to disrespect them because they 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 grew the game and the clubhouses we sit in they built. You know, like so you want to be respectful to them, but also you're like, well, your attitude and and your your negativity and your and your gatekeeping is now is now is now breaking the momentum that you that you that you began, and so now you're just. You know, you're eating sandwiches with a crust cut off and traveling on our dime and swilling your gin and drinking your rose. And really, you just need to get out of the way um, because you're you're now a detriment to the game. So it's all well and good if you built it, it doesn't, doesn't give you the right to burn it down. And uh, they're all spending money like, like they're FIFA executives and they're not. They're rugby executives, which is one 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 thousandth of the money that FIFA have. Um, and anyway, if they want to be FIFA, they've got to hit a whole whole new level of corruption that they're not even ready for. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think you're right about MLR in the US. Uh, there's been a few attempts to get professional rugby started there, which have failed. But this one looks like it's got legs now and is here to stay, certainly for, well, certainly post-World Cup in 2031, I'm sure. But so what would you what would you change, Dan, about Rugby Canada? What what are some of the things that you think, right, that would be a quick fix, that could get stuff moving in the right direction? You know, what, what are some of the ideas that you have? Oh, it absolutely will stop. I mean, there's, there's so many things. But in, in BC, we'd move the season uh, from January to June. Right now we do um, September, like August, late August, September to May. And so we have, you know, we're asking amateur players to stay in shape over, you know, we, we finished early December and they're back late January. So we're asking amateur players to stay in shape for two months and then come back, come back at the, uh, the top of their game to compete for the, compete for the, for the um, provincials, you know? Um, and then we have, um, um, yeah, it's, it's just that, that gap's too much. So, that the, so our, our season should be January to June. And then if people want to carry on playing, they can. The Calgary season starts, I think, um, June, July, so they can they can get our Alberta if they want to carry on playing. Um, we need to get more people involved in rugby that have both rugby and business acumen. Um, we need to stop using the players like Duracell batteries, you know, for uh, for trips for executives. Um, and there just needs to be transparency. We just re- need to reconnect with our players and reconnect with our clubs. It's very much and has been for a long time them and us, um, and the divide is horrible because that's not what that's not what powers the rugby community. The rugby community is powered by connections and, and networking, and you know even though your rivals cross the road, you hate them and you want to put 20, 20 50 points in them every time you play them. You, you're still friends with the chairman. You still have a drink while you're watching the games. You know, like and you still ring up and banter like you know the weeks leading up to the game. Like, there's no real hate there, but. People, and they won't hear it because they can't hear it, but people hate, people hate Rugby Canada. They hate them. And it's, it's, it's almost like a dictatorship. Um, so, like, I would I would have somebody run Rugby Canada that has some business acumen and some rugby passion and uh, and have them have them set out their stall um, and visit, visit the clubs, get on the road for a year, 18 months, two years, Visit visit clubs up and down the country, connect with them, create social media that empowers grassroots and, and things like that. Um, I completely get out of wokeness and uh, campaigns and political campaigns. Just focus on rugby. Uh, it does no good. It does no good for the game. No one's asking you to hate anybody. No one's asking you to. Um, no one's asking you to be disinterested about people. Keep the inclusivity inclusivity campaigns going if you must. Um, 
but other other issues which you know I, I won't go into but other issues need to stay out of rugby it just needs to be a sport you don't see you don't see Canada basketball go into all this sort of stuff and things like that but this uh they, they almost spend more time on these campaigns than they do the actual rugby themselves so um you know why um it just once again because it papers over cracks isn't it um yeah it just they just need to need to put some passion into the game and the, the rugby almost seems rugby almost seems like a burden to rugby canada which is which is astounding they've like for example they've, they've been doing these internationals at bc place for the whole time i've been in this country um the only one that was any anywhere near successful was rugby canada versus the Maori all blacks which i think there were about um 20 25 26 000 that but the stadium holds fifty five thousand people um and they've just announced that they're going to have like some of the pacific nations games there which will be like for you know fiji b team versus canada and things like that and it's it's just there's going to be ten thousand people there and, and, they, and they put that on tv and it just looks embarrassing and just doesn't doesn't have any have any uh make you know give any any passion to the game doesn't, doesn't make the game look good whereas BC, we're in vancouver we have bc place it's an internationally renowned stadium they have the canada sevens there every year it's fifty five thousand seats you could get if you put the all blacks island all blacks england all blacks australia if you put a marquee game in there there on, on a saturday during the Auckland nationals just like they did soldier field you would sell it out and that would be massive for canada no, and it would sell out. It, it would, you do a budget of two point three million. You give each, even if you gave each team a million dollars, um, three hundred thousand for for the costs of marketing, etc. If you sold every every seat, I think it's for for forty two dollars, which is like that would break even. Like, but the tickets would be, and that, that's just that's 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 not boxes, that's not front seats, that's just like every seat of fifty five thousand. Whereas tickets would generally be between seventy five and one hundred and fifty. So you'd you'd make almost a two million dollar profit on that game, which would sell out overnight, because Vancouver's a hub. Not only would you have everybody from Canada wanting to go to that game, you'd also have people come up from Seattle and Portland. You'd have people fly across from Chicago. You'd have people fly across from Toronto. Um, they they completely underestimate, and, and and to be fair, so does so does the American market. They completely underestimate and. Um, don't research hard enough their, their immigrant uh, expat market um, outside of you, you know the stat for the stat for America is that only between five and ten percent of Americans are rugby fans. Do you know how many people that is? <laughs> yeah, it's right. Like, it's a lot. It's, it's like twenty two million people. It's more than it's more than England fans. Like it's almost like twenty two million people. No one's marketing to these people. No one's. No, but you see these Americans, these these Americans are you know, supposedly broke in a the recession. They travel all over the country to plan these tournaments to see their friends in, in they come up to Banff and Williams Lake and then they're over in Missoula and then they're in New York and then they're you know then they're down in uh, down in some other ski resort and then they're over in Seattle and then they're down in Portland. Like almost almost every weekend of the summer plan a different tournament. Like because that's their that's their thing, you know. Yeah, for sure. Now, um, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, the Rugby World Cup coming up in, in the US there in 2031. What is is there any kind of feel amongst the Canadian players at the moment in terms of like grassroots? Is there a sort of excitement building already? Is it being talked about? Um, what's the scene? No. Nothing at all? No, it's not being talked about whatsoever. Still too far away or just <laughs> lack of interest? Or what, what do you think? I don't think many people know we're hosting it. Right. <laughs> Genuinely, I don't think I don't think many people know it's coming. Um, it's uh, yeah, there just there needs to be a path of, uh, of of growth and positivity put through put through rugby in this country. Um, it's uh, yeah, it makes me sound like a negative Nelly, but like. You have to come and experience the, the rugby in this country to see that you know, there's so many there's so many good people here. Like they, they, we, we should have no problem. We have all the school systems. We have all the we all have all the key people in place. Every club has passionate, like amazing people that are like that are involved, um, and they're just not being they're not being harnessed. You know, they're not being listened to. Um, and then the, 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 the and all these people aren't paid. They're all volunteers. 
they're all in it for the love of the game. But the people that are being paid are just they're borderline, just mercenaries, you know, dead dead from the dead from the neck down. You know, like there's no passion, there's no drive, there's no there's no uh, there's no moxie there. It's just they just uh, go to do their nine to five, they go home, um, and there's just no there's no connection, there's no connection there. Um, and uh, the, nothing's nothing's changing and nothing's progressing. So, I'm quite frankly, I'm, I'm I'm terrified for the future of rugby in, in Canada, particularly. I think the US will always survive, um, but I think the rugby, the Canadian amateur rugby market, will will shrink by probably fifty percent in the next ten years. Oof, brutal. Yeah. <clears throat> well, they've only got one hundred twenty-five thousand players now, so yeah. Right. Yeah, that is worrying times. Um, I mean, I know, I don't know many countries that really love their governing body, let's put it that way. But this sounds like a whole different level of, you know, sort of neglect and, and almost like watching it disappear off a cliff. Oh, 100%. 100%. And it's, you, you try, and, and as, a, as an independent that markets rugby, myself and is passionate about rugby and I you know, promote grassroots players and I promote grassroots events and things like that. You try all sorts of manner of ways to connect with them. Like, you know, you're the you're the advocate. You're you're you're, you're the you're the rugby rugby advocate, and you know you're you're aggressive with them, and you know you try and you know you try and combat them on social media, and try and call them out, and they don't like that. You try and be their friend, they don't like that. You try and show them what you're doing, you know, and, and how how what you're doing and partnering with you could benefit them, and then they want their they want their uh, want their tribute. And I'm like, I'm not giving you that because this is better for you than for me. But you know, I have an interest in rugby, um, so they don't want that. So there's, there's, there's no, there's no way of um, imagine, imagine the Death Star where they hadn't when when and, and where they uh, they hadn't left that one foul safe in. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's rugby candy. You can try all the attack routes you want. And you can try. You can try all the. You can you can, you can fly down all the uh, all the alleyways you want. Try and find that one hole to blow up the Death Star. And like, they just no. Nope, they've uh, they've pasted they've they've pasted over it. They've uh, they've bricked it up. Where we're all doomed, and uh, the Ewoks are all getting fried. <laughs> <laughs> that is some analogy, Dan. I love it. <laughs> but it wasn't so terrifying. Uh, okay. <laughs> Let's talk about that lovely bit of stash that you're wearing there with the uh, 99 social logo on it. And uh, tell me all about it and what you're doing with pints and scrums. Uh, so, yep. So this is the this is our, our Macron hoodies, and uh, they're very comfy. And it's really the, the best stash that we've we've uh, ever produced. We used to get some great kit from Cookery as well, but these uh, these hoodies I think are my are my favourite bit that we've done. Um, the 99 social started in uh, 2000. Um, and 11 2010 2011 and it was basically just i was trying to get more people to come out to the pub to watch rugby so we could have like the rugby days like we do back home um but then it sort of morphed into rugby tours and um viewing parties in multiple cities and and stash and um being a rugby advocate and falling out with rugby canada and being friends with rugby canada and falling out with rugby canada um and and social media content and memes and banter to the point where I think we're about almost at thirty two thousand followers now um on Instagram. I think we've got eleven thousand on Facebook. Um we run like six six rugby tours, six lion style rugby tours with uh with around just under two hundred two hundred players get involved in that. And then we promote um international rugby news. You know, the main national rugby plus grassroots news from Canada, the US, uh, Ireland, and the UK. Um, uh, we have uh, ambassadors. We have an ambassador in each each of the four markets who feed us news and feed us photography and things like that as well. Uh, and basically, the brand is there. The, the, the motto of the brand, and Pints and Scrums, is the hook for the Instagram, but the brand is 99 Social. Um, the the main well, the the slogan for the for the brand is keep rugby social um because we don't want people to think that rugby is just professional pathways like it's a very it's a very social game and you know whether you, you know not everybody in fact the vast majority of people are going to be professional rugby players or want to be professional rugby players there's plenty of room for people to be social it's a beer it's friends it's 
It's uh, rugby jerseys. It's it's going it's going to games together. It's going on tour together. Going on holiday together. It's you know it's uh, cleaning up the clubhouse and painting the walls. It's 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 all, all sort of, it's, it's running youth youth rugby coaching. It's uh it's all sorts of stuff and just just trying to keep everybody in the in the good side of the game and uh, and keeping them keeping them involved. Hundred percent. Now I I'm a big fan of your Instagram account in particular. There's a lot of sort of comedy in there, sort of banter. There's a lot of recognizing achievements as well. Where does the kind of concept for what kind of content you produce? Where does that come from exactly? Well, it's been a work in progress over. I think we started the Instagram in 2012, but I only really started going sort of pretty hard on the Instagram uh, as many of us did like during the pandemic, sort of 2019, 2020. Um, it's it's basically um, uses a vessel to promote our international rugby events, like the Six Nations and Rugby World Cup and things like that, plus anything grassroots. Um, and those are kind of like the two, uh, the two. And then we do we do memes around the internationals and things like that. But recently, I found out that it's the weird thing is Instagram has a sense of humor, and we get no problem with our content on Instagram. But we get one level of viewer on Instagram. On Facebook, so many more people follow up individual posts on Facebook, like into the six figures. But everybody's offended by everything on Facebook. So I don't know what the uh, I don't know what the answer is. But I mean, we're not going to stop offending people because that seems to get more views. So, uh, um, <laughs> like recently, we just did a post where uh, um, the Frenchman's got his arm around a Welsh guy, and uh, he's just he, uh, we just, he's just saying like. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Your Welshness must be such a burden. We are French. We are sexy. Our food is so much better. Like, you know, I, I you know I, I feel for you, my friend. Like, and just some of the some of the abuse, like Facebook, Instagram thought was hilarious. Facebook absolutely erupted with like, you're you're racist against the Welsh. Um, <laughs> you're uh, the, the the I remember. You know, I'd rather be I'd rather be. Uh, uh, Welsh and a cheese eater and all this sort of stuff, and uh, but then again, 100, 175,000 views, eleven hundred comments, like all this sort of stuff, and like it's uh, yeah, it's 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 really Facebook. So face so, so basically, the basics of this are Instagram has a sense of humor, Facebook doesn't. It's uh, is the basics of it, but uh, yeah, it's been it's been steadily growing. Um, obviously, Instagram messed around. It, primarily it's an Instagram account, but we share our stuff to fa- a Facebook page as well. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been it's been going well. We're growing steadily. Um, we've started doing um, uh, subscriptions now for like four dollars a month. That go, you know, we send all the money goes to grassroots rugby. Um, and yeah, it's it's, uh, it, it's going good. The, the Six Nations was, we did Six Nations this year in three cities: Calgary, Toronto, and Vancouver. Went really good. Rugby World Cup was massive. Um, I think um, just the Ireland South Africa game alone in the Rugby World Cup. I think we had in the region of fifteen hundred fans out across the three venues. So, it's, so when you uh, say three cities, what do you mean? Are you running events at certain locations? Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah, we do viewing parties for like the major internationals. So we'll have a we have a we have a pub in um, uh, Vancouver called Dublin Calling, and they 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 have a they have a, a sister pub in Toronto, a Dublin Calling there as well. So we do Dublin Calling in Toronto and Vancouver, and then uh, Calgary Rugby Union in Calgary. They have a big clubhouse there, so we promote their games for them as well and make sure people are going out for the rugby and supporting their supporting their uh, their bar and their facility so just 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 basically getting people out to to watch the games amazing okay that's really cool and uh, aside from more of the same have you got any sort of plans any future ideas that you might try and exploit yeah well so the, because of the amount of fans that are in the americas and the amount of fans that i know are in canada we're we're trying to build 99 social into a whole sort of like lifestyle brand like um like the content we're gonna do some more uh, long form content on youtube um interviewing great you know, gra- yeah no disrespect to them like we're not looking to interview sort of nigel owens or james hasker and like that i want to interview grassroots players uh people involved in the game um and uh, build a youtube channel out of that uh, merch um, events 
um, more events across America. Uh, so we're just we're putting business plans together now and trying to get investors uh, to see if we can go on a bit of a trip for four or five months and create a bunch of content and just touch base with a bunch of people and become sort of like there's so much distrust in rugby in 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 functions and in brands and in in um, in governing bodies that we want to create a uh, a brand and create a um, um, uh, a thing that grassroots players and clubs really um really connect with and can trust you know yeah 100 percent. that sounds amazing and very much uh right up my street to be honest um yeah, okay. it's, 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 yeah. yeah i mean before we move on to the the stash section to finish off is there any kind of closing thoughts about sort of rugby canada or anything else uh that you want to sort of mention um i just i just wish they would i just wish they'd be more transparent and I wish they connect with uh, with rugby clubs more. And um, at some point, um, the clubs themselves and and the, and the good people in the game need to decide how this is how this is going to move forward, and if they want the game or not. Because at some point, you know, it has to be a bit more aggressive, and maybe rugby can they need to be dissolved or need to have their you know we need to turn their back our backs on them and create our own. Because at the end of the day, it's just a members club. Um, yeah, we need to create a new organisation with some integrity and and uh, that has an interest in growing the game. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Okay, well, that bombshell, let's move on to the stash section. What, Dan, is your favourite bit of stash that you've ever received? Um, oh, so hard. I, I used to love the uh, London Iron. Oh, well, it's, I that's not stash, but I, I love these hoodies. Like I know there, are, I know there are hoodies, but I love these hoodies. They're great. Um, uh, Lions gear, British and Irish Lions gear. I, I love it. I spend too much money on it. Any tour that comes out, I spend all the money. Um, and uh, yeah, I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Okay, if we go Lions gear, then that's cool. And what is your favourite kit of all time? So this can be any team from any era. Uh, L- London Irish Guinness jersey from around about um, where is it? 2010, I moved it. Right, around 2007, 2008. Okay. That uh, London Irish had a, a Guinness. I can't remember what, 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 what who it was made by, but uh, it was Guinness sponsored it, and it was uh, it was a sexy looking jersey. I liked it a lot. Nice, good choice. And what about all they, they rest in peace, London Irish. Oh, they'll be back. I reckon. I reckon they might be back. You know, we'll see. So. Yeah. Um, what about awful kits? Uh, Dan, anything you'd rather burn than wear? Um, oh, my God. What? Not burn than wear. Well, there's there's three kits that won't touch my body ever. Like, it doesn't matter how much money you could offer me. In this order, France, Wales, Australia. You can't you can't give it to me. I won't, I won't have it. I'll, get, I'll, I'll donate it to charity. Um, <laughs> it won't touch my skin. But we you ever give Samoa and Tonga a decent jersey? Like I love Macron, so I'm not, I'm not slagging Macron off, but I'm kind of appealing to Macron. Give them, give them a good jersey. Look into their culture. Look into some patterns and and some symbols of their culture, and, and build a. But it did did um, I think Nike did an amazing job with the Fiji jerseys for this World Cup just gone. They're amazing, amazing. Fiji and uh, Tonga and Samoa need a good jersey now. And uh, I think they're both Macron, so Macron needs to get on that and give them something, a bit, give, give them something a bit more, a bit more cultural and a bit more jazzy, you know. Yeah, that's a nice call to action to finish with there, Dan. Now then, if people want to get a hold of you and find out more about what you're doing uh, or anything to do with what we've discussed, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Uh, they can get hold of us um, at Pints and Scrums on Instagram. Just send us a DM. Um, we're always looking for contributions from local rugby clubs. We always want to promote local rugby clubs, local rugby pubs. Um, we're an advocate for the rugby hospitality. Um, and uh, we, um, on our subscription channel, we have almost, we have over 100 pubs listed that show rugby in our four different markets. So people can search to find out where the best places are to, uh, to watch rugby. Amazing. Pints and scrums, two of my most favourite things in the whole world. So that's fantastic. And people at home, we will link all of that in the show notes for you, which you can find at amateurrugbypodcast.com. 
So at least just leaving to say, Dan, thank you so much for your time today in this uh, quality conversation. Thank you, sir. It's been great. Good man. There he goes. Okay, Dan, wildly strong opinions there, which I love. And, you know, rugby needs to be sorted out in lots and lots of places. Sounds like Canada is very much top of that list. Um, okay, back during the great rugby run over the last three years, I've visited hundreds of rugby clubs across the UK. And a common theme that I found was people clubs struggling a little bit with their social media in lots of different ways so if that's you if you feel like you could do with some help with your social media go to amateurrugbypodcast.com forward slash social and just drop your details in there and let me know what struggles you have and I'm looking to maybe put out some free training or some assistance or just help in any way that I can so if you've enjoyed this podcast you can do all the social media stuff like follow subscribe all of that jazz which is great but what I'd really like is if you mention it to someone in person the next time you're down your local rugby club. And until then, get out and play.